Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. We have a lot to talk about today. First, Brian Koberger travels in style. That's right, taking private air travel to his new abode. A convicted killer says, hey, I'm innocent. I think it's that Rex Hewerman guy. Yes, we have the uh, Trump attempted assassin appears in court. Ashley Benefield wants a new trial after a jury rejected her claim of self-defense. And according to an indictment in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, apparently there is corruption in New York City. Who would have thought? Say it isn't so. A murder for hire scenario that actually went through where the person wasn't a cop. And finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer. Lawyer. Good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below. Hit that little bell for notifications. And remember, you can check us out on any of your favorite podcasting apps. And I was looking at the numbers over the weekend. We have over 2 million downloads on the podcast, ladies and gentlemen, not including YouTube and Facebook, all that stuff. 2 million downloads on our podcast. Amazing. All right. Hope you had a great weekend. Um, I was just showing Frank what I did. I'll have him put this picture up, but I went fly fishing with the lovely Miss Kristen. And guess what? I caught the biggest fish I've ever caught in my life other than out in deep sea fishing. Went, uh, went fly fishing up near Bailey, Colorado. Check out this picture. Look at that fish. Is that amazing or what? That's amazing. Check it out. All right. First on the docket for September 16th of 2024. That's right. The uh, University of Idaho murder suspect, Brian Koberger. Well, check this out. He has a new mugshot after being transported via private airplane. A few hundred miles uh, for his new um, living arrangements there in Ada County. That's right. Uh, Brian Koberger was flown Sunday to Idaho's capital, Boise, for those who don't know that, after being granted a change of venue uh, to take his trial away from Latah County, where obviously he's accused of brutally stabbing four students in their college rental home there in Moscow, Idaho. Now, Koberger was seen arriving in Boise on a private plane and then was transferred to a black SUV in his little orange jumpsuit and handcuffs. Traveling like he owns the place, ladies and gentlemen. He is getting what he wants. Now, don't get me wrong. I love private transportation. And one of these days soon, I feel it. I feel it. Hopefully in the next week or two, Crime Talk 1 will be back in business. But guess what? I pay for Crime Talk 1. Brian Koberger gets to travel first class at the Idaho taxpayer expense. Why couldn't they have just put him in the back of a van and driven him those 300 miles from Latah County to Ada County? That's what they would do with just about everybody else that was being transferred there for a court or some other proceeding. Seems like maybe this guy could be getting a little bit of special treatment. Just throwing that out there. Like I said, look at this new mugshot. Yeah, must be growing the beard out for the ladies. Can you imagine how many uh, new... Uh, pen pals he's going to get after his uh, little rough and tumble look that he's got? Apparently. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see for that as well. So as you know, if you've been watching Crime Talk, you know that Judge 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 uh, ordered the transfer last Monday, citing several reasons to move the trial to a larger courthouse and remove him from the location of the crime, including fears that people were going to burn the courthouse down if Mr. Koberger was in fact acquitted. I think that's a little excessive. I don't think the great people there in Idaho would do that. And, you know, who knows? We'll have to wait and see what the verdict will be. But I don't think people in Latah County would burn the place down. I think that's a little extreme. But that's what the judge said. Anyway, Koberger's defense alleged there would be an unfair prejudice due to pretrial publicity if the trial were held in the uh, tight-knit Latah County, where jurors were more likely to have an emotional response to the killing. Now, don't get me wrong. I think the judge made the appropriate ruling based upon the evidence that was presented at the change of venue hearing. And since the prosecution presented no evidence evidence as it relates to their position that the people in Latah County could give Brian Koberger a fair trial, that they were not tainted, but the prosecution chose 
not to do their own survey, and second, presented no evidence other than some really weak arguments, the judge really had no choice but to grant the change of venue motion. Now, Ada County, that's in Boise, uh, has a much um, larger population in which to pull a potential jury from, and therefore trying to ensure that Brian Koberger would receive a fair trial. Obviously, there's more jurors, more diluted, I guess is the term that they use, and um, therefore a uh, better chance of getting a fair and impartial jury. We, we get that. Now, Koberger is also um, getting a change of abode, uh, just like he received the change of venue. He's being held there in uh, Ada County, and uh, he will be housed by himself. Due to safety concerns for both inmates and employees within the facility, we'll have to see. Anyway, his length of stay is temporary. It's listed as temporary because he's being held uh, for the court and because the Ada County Sheriff's Office did not make the arrest or bring uh, forth the charges. Now, the uh, Ada County Sheriff's Office uh, gave a statement and said several factors were considered in planning and preparing for Brian Koberger's move to the Ada County Jail. First and foremost was wanting to do it most safely and efficiently. And thanks to the wonderful partnership with the Idaho State Police, we could use their aircraft because it simply made the most sense given the distance of travel and complications that may have come up using ground transportation. What, was somebody going to break Brian Koberger out? They couldn't, they transport prisoners all the time via the back of a van. Why is Brian Koberger special? Like I said, I love private aviation. I do. Don't get me wrong. Once you do it, you never want to go back. Ask Brian Koberger, right? He is probably never going to fly commercial again. And now he's going to have to live by his private transportation. Anyway, we'll leave that right there for that. Anyway, um, also uh, last week, a, uh, another ruling was uh, done by the uh, Idaho Supreme Court, which appointed a new judge to the case. Now it's Judge Stephen Hippler. He is a judge in um, Ada County. Now, he is the uh, judge there in the 4th Judicial District. And uh, like I said, he will assume the case. Uh, his uh, current term ends in uh, January of 2027. That's when he'll be up for re-election. Now, he has no worries of uh, not being re-elected as a judge. Uh, he won a general election uh, back in 2022 as the judges are appointed, and then they have to run for re-election thereafter. But what do we know about this guy? Well, we know that he earned his uh, bachelor's degree from Boise State, and then he got his uh, Juris Doctorate from the University of Utah. Uh, he's been a judge since 2013 there in the 4th Judicial District. And uh, prior to that, from 2002, until he became a judge, he was a um, partner at Givens Pursley. And um, he apparently has lots of experience handling some very serious cases, as do lots of judges. But let's see. Uh, last month, he oversaw the trial of a brutal prison beating that was so severe that the victim uh, died of his injuries while at the hospital. In March, Judge Hippler handed down a life sentence to a drunken driver who intentionally struck two pedestrians, one fatally, noting at sentencing that the defendant has shown that the community is not safe with him in it at this time and for a long time. Last year, Judge Hippler oversaw the conclusion of the murder case against David Randall, who tortured and beat his ex-girlfriend before stabbing her to death, then stopped by to pick up her son's belongings. The killer initially pled guilty to a uh, plea deal to avoid the death penalty, but then he tried to back out of it. Anyway, Hippler rejected that argument and ultimately sentenced him to life in prison with a um, chance of parole after 25 years. The victim in that case, Darla Fletcher, was stabbed more than 50 times with a screwdriver and drumsticks. And we're not talking what you get at KFC, ladies and gentlemen. Drumsticks that you beat on a drum. That's right. In 2022, Hippler sentenced both parents of a nine-year-old uh, by the name of Emmerich Osuna to life without parole for killing their son. Uh, he was tortured, beaten, and starved to death, and police were able to recover evidence from the nanny cam running into their apartment. He imposed a 100-year no-contact order barring the parents from speaking with their other children. That ought to cover it while they're in custody. And while Hippler often agreed to prosecutor sentencing requests, he hasn't imposed the death penalty. Records show he uh, took the bench in 2013, as I noted, and um, the uh, last uh, execution 
in uh, Idaho was carried out last year. Now, prosecutors in the uh, Koberger case have already said that they plan to seek the death penalty if he is in fact convicted. And the defense is obviously trying to do everything they can to take that away as a sentencing option. Next, a convicted murderer says, I didn't do it. Go check out Rex Hewerman. That's right, a Long Island man convicted of two killings in the early 1990s is seeking review of his case after the alleged Gilgo Beach serial killer Rex Hewerman was charged in some eerily similar homicides during the same time period. Now, John Bitroff, um, who was convicted in the 1993 murder of Rita Tengredi and the 1994 killing of Colleen McNamee, is pushing for exoneration after Hewerman was indicted in the 1993 killing of Sandra Costillo, a murder Bitroff was long suspected of committing. Now, Bitroff's attorney, a woman by the name of Lisa Marcocchio, called the crime scene of the three murders eerily similar and asked that the district attorney's office perform DNA testing on hairs found at the Tangredi and McNamee crime scenes. She also asked the office of the district attorney to release forensic evidence from the Costillo crime scene to her. Now, all three women, Sandra Rita and Colleen, were all killed within the same time frame. All three women were found in the wooden, wooded area. Their legs were spread apart with their hands above their heads, and they were each missing one shoe. Now, Colleen and Sandra both had their shirts pulled up over their faces, and the DAs also had claimed that there were wood chips on all three bodies. Any local person would believe one person was responsible for all three murders. Well, the district attorney says, eh, not so fast. Now, this district attorney, Ray Tierney, who was not in office when Bitroff was charged and convicted, denied Marcocchio's request. The DA says, I've looked at those cases. If I thought that there was a problem with them, I would do something. Now, before Bitroff's 2014 arrest, the Suffolk County investigation had long publicly said they believed the person responsible for the deaths of Tangredi and McNamee was responsible for the killing of Costilla. Now, Marcocchio, who previously filed two unsuccessful motions to overturn Bitroff's convictions, sent the DA letter on June 6, the day that Humer pled not guilty to second-degree murder charges in the Costillo case. In the letter, she asked prosecutors to turn over records of Humer's related to the Costillo case, including any forensic analysis conducted from the Costillo crime scene and all information obtained through devices that are relevant to all three slains. The goal of the district attorney's office is not to win, but to seek justice, the attorney reminded the DA. Now, after not receiving a response, a uh, f she filed a second letter on June 18th to prosecutors once again repeating her request, but was denied two days later by the assistant district attorney who wrote that there is no basis in law or fact for providing you with any of these materials. The DA wrote, as you are aware, Rex Hurman has been indicted for the Costillo murder. Um, now, whether your client was ever investigated for the Costillo murder, it is evident that he was not charged in that case. Neither the fact that he was not charged nor that Mr. Hewerman has not been charged is exculpatory to Mr. Bitroff's murder conviction. As you may recall, Hewerman was linked to Costillo through the mitochondrial DNA testing on hair found at the crime scene, while Bitroff was linked to the Tangredi and McNamee through DNA testing of semen found in each of their bodies. Hewerman was arrested in July of 2023 for the brutal killings of the three women and then was charged with murder of three other women over the year. Now, his murder trial is expected to begin in Suffolk County in uh, September. Now, the attorney for Bitroff believes that testing the DNA evidence could assist Bitroff in his appeal and post-conviction matters. And uh, there was unknown hair found on both Rita and Colin's body that were never tested, according to the attorney. Now, police have released new information about the Gilgo Beach murder and one of the unidentified bodies known as Asian Doe. Well, the Gilgo Beach murders became what was described as a dumping ground for the killer or killers during the 1990s and early 2000s. In all, 11 bodies were found in the area. But they have now come up with a new artistic rendering uh, of what the victim may have looked like before his death.
That's right, I said his death. Police say he was likely from southern China between the ages of 17 and 23, and his death occurred at least five years before the body was found in April of 2011. It turns out that the victim turns out to be a biological man who was wearing women's clothing when he was discovered. A bra, a blue ribbed crew neck, and a uh, branded shirt prompt investigators consider that he may have been living as a woman. The uh, police said they believe the Asian doe may have been working as a sex worker. They believe that they uh, spent some time in New York City prior to their death. The district attorney noted because the victim was wearing exclusively women's clothing at the time of his death, it's possible they were identified as a woman or when known by others as being a woman. The uh, district attorney's office noted that the task force does not forget victims and we will not stop in their pursuit of justice. This person remains nameless to us. Someone knows who this individual may be. A $2,500 reward has been offered for information leading to the identification of Asian Doe. Now, Rex Heuerman, obviously, you know, is an architect from Manhattan, and he was arrested in 2023 and charged with the murder of six women, at least four of whom were sex workers prior to their death. Of course, he denies any involvement in their deaths and has pled not guilty. And we will, of course, give him that presumption of innocence. Now, the district attorney says that four of the bodies linked to Mr. Heerman, known as the Gilgo Four, were I almost identical and unique from um, other remains found in the area. He said that speculation about the potential killer doesn't matter until you can bring charges. And we're certainly not at that stage as of yet. Like I said, the body of the Asian doe was discovered between Megan Waterman and Jessica Taylor on the stretch of highway on the Gilgo Beach, the DA notes. Now, Mr. Heerman has not been named as a suspect in the Asian doe death. It just keeps getting more and more interesting in that Heerman case. And guess what? We still have our Rex Heerman shirt here. <laughs> Remember, the pizza is amazing, but make sure you finish the crust. Otherwise, that genealogical DNA will get you every time, ladies and gentlemen. Finish your pizza. Don't take your phone. <laughs> Just a little joke there, all right? Next, the Trump would-be assassin appears in court. What do we know so far? Well, the would-be assassin accused of trying to kill former President Donald Trump smiled and laughed as he uh, made his first appearance in federal court where he was charged with a gun charge. That's right. So the gun charge is a placeholder because guess what? This guy, Mr. Ryan Wesley Routh, R-O-U-T-H, um, is a convicted felon. Why? Because he got convicted in North Carolina of having a semi-automatic weapon. So now he is a convicted felon in possession of a firearm. Now you say, no, 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 Scott, that can't happen. Because if you're a prohibited person, you wouldn't go buy a gun because there's a law against that. Anyway, it's a placeholder. I would anticipate that more charges will be brought and I will explain here in a moment. So um, new photos of the uh, suspect of Ryan Wesley Routh smiling and his stomach exposed after he was arrested in West Palm Beach, Florida while fleeing the scene where he attempted to kill the former president. Now, this guy is about 58 years old, and he is accused of using an AK-47. Okay, not an AR-15, ladies and gentlemen, an AK-47. It carries 7.62 rounds, and it is the preferred weapon of communists around the world. Now, some people say it's garbage. Other people say... The beauty of the AK-47 is literally you could pick it up out of the dirt and it will more than likely fire. All true. I have fired them in the past. I don't like them, but I don't think they're accurate. And thank goodness it wasn't accurate in this case either. What we do know is this alleged assassin uh, was apparently pointing the AK-47 through a fence while he was uh, the president was playing a round of golf at the Trump International Golf Club on Sunday. Now, what is interesting was, was this is apparently a very impromptu golf uh, outing with a former president and a couple of his friends. Wasn't on his schedule whatsoever. The question that needs to be answered is, how did this guy know to be out there? Hmm, 
makes you wonder, doesn't it? Fortunately, uh, the former president was not um, injured in this latest assassination attempt, and he was rushed to safety by uh, Secret Service in yet another close call less than two months after he was shot in the head during his rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. Now, Mr. Routh was apparently in his prison garb today, as well he should be, uh, when he appeared in court today. Now, the hearing was only about 10 minutes long, and uh, he was charged with two counts, possession of a firearm while a convicted fe felon, and possession of a firearm with an obliterated serial number. Oh, jeez. So this guy, this guy is a felon. He knows he can't possess firearms, but he does anyway against the law. And then he buys a gun that either has the serial number obliterated or obliterates it himself so it can't be traced. Hmm, isn't that convenient? Well, currently he faces up to 20 years for the um, initial two charges. And as I noted, these are placeholders. I believe when he is indicted formally, they will include some sort of attempt on the life of um, the former president, whoever was there as well, and possibly even Secret Service agents. Now, one of the things that people have suggested is that, hey, you really can't trust the feds in a situation like this. Perhaps the state could charge this guy as well. Well, in theory, they could. There could be two cases pending. Now, normally the feds and the states talk and they decide who's going to take it, but the state can file their own charges, say like of attempted murder, and let the feds do their thing as well. And when he gets done with one case, he can do it with the other. I would certainly maybe, you know, make sure Let's check all the video equipment. Let's make sure we have good correctional officers who aren't going to go to sleep when the count needs to be done. Because um, I think a lot of stuff is going to come out about this Mr. Routh, that he did a lot of fundraising. He actually was a big promoter of trying to get basically mercenaries to go fight in Ukraine. He's been interviewed by the New York Times, Newsweek, and other news organizations about his efforts to get people to go to Ukraine and uh, fight. But what we do know here in this particular situation was that he was apparently um, around the golf course for several hours before he ultimately fled and the uh, police gave chase. Now, how do we know this? Well, he took his cell phone and it was apparently being tracked in this wooded area around the course from about 1.59 a.m. in the morning until about 1.30 in the afternoon. So for about 12 hours, he was lingering around down there. Once again, kind of interesting since nobody knew the guy was going to play golf. Hmm. This new information suggests that Mr. Ralph was uh, staking out the location and somehow knew that the former president would be there golfing on Sunday, even though it wasn't released to anybody else. Anyway, he will face formal arraignment in two weeks. His uh, permanent public defender uh, was not available, hence the reason for that. Now, the Secret Service opened fire on Routh in the West Palm Beach area after they spotted the muzzle of his AK-47, the preferred weapon of communists, poking through a fence at the Trump International Golf Club while the um, presidential nominee was playing a round of golf. Now, Routh was arrested in Martin County on Sunday, which is about 50 miles from the scene of the golf course shooting. Now, he's provided a little bit of information in court, kind of the routine stuff that people are required required to let people know to see if they qualify for the public defender, even though they're in custody. Mr. Routh said that he made roughly about $3,000 per month. He has no savings, no real estate, no assets besides his two trucks that are in Hawaii, and he claims that they're worth about $1,000. He is, in fact, indigent and will qualify for the public defender, even if he were to not remain in custody. Oh, he will remain in custody. Anyway, Mr. Routh uh, apparently uh, sometimes helps out his 25-year-old son uh, financially, but apparently they're somewhat estranged. Now, like I said, Mr. Routh did not enter a plea of not guilty because he doesn't have permanent legal representation as of yet. He also has a bond hearing set for September 23rd and a probable cause hearing slash an arraignment for September 30th. Like I said, this is a placeholder. The government is proceeding by an information signed by a magistrate that says there's information to believe that a crime was committed and that this guy may have had something to do with it. But in federal court, you're required to uh, be indicted. So between now and the 30th, 
the United States attorney will go to the grand jury and present formal charges to the grand jury. The grand jury will decide, and of course they will, that there are crimes that have been committed by this guy. And um, he will be formally indicted at that time. Therefore, there will be no preliminary hearing. The matter will then proceed to arraignment where he will enter a plea of not guilty. They will usually be directed to go to chambers and get trial dates. Now remember, federal court moves rather quickly. Usually, from the time you enter a plea of not guilty, you got to go to trial um, about 90 days out unless there's some sort of um, ends of justice continuance. This case is not complex. This could easily be done uh, within that 90-day period. It will probably be extended for the defense to get up to speed, maybe do some investigation, maybe do some mitigation, probably check this guy and see if he's psycho, the, those types of things. But this case should be resolved relatively quickly. Now, the uh, Martin County Sheriff, a guy by the name of Will Schneider, kind of uh, stoked some conspiracy theories outside of uh, the courthouse today. He says, how does a guy from not here, referring to Hawaii or North Carolina, get all the way to the Trump International Golf Course, realize that the former president of the United States is golfing and is able to get a rifle in that vicinity? And the sheriff said, uh, while well, speaking to local media, is this guy part of a conspiracy, a lone gunman? The sheriff questioned. If he is a lone gunman, President Trump is that much safer because we now have him, the uh, sheriff said. Now, if he is part of a conspiracy, then this whole thing takes on a very ominous tone. The sheriff also said, uh, this is a once in a lifetime event. How many people get a shot off at the former president of the United States? The poor guy was already been shot at once, and then for that suspect to come into this county? Anyway, the sheriff uh, compared himself and his team to the Dallas police who caught President John F. Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, Ralph had a, a backpack and a bag hanging from the chain link fence near the uh, sixth hole of the golf course. He also left behind a GoPro camera and his AK-47, the preferred rifle of communists. And I say communist countries. They were manufactured in Russia. A Russian guy made it. And then they've exported them all over the world, mostly to communist countries. And apparently there was some sort of ceramic layered bulletproof body armor that he had as well. So the guy was looking for a gunfight. I'm sure it'll just be a death by cop kind of scenario, right? Anyway... Like I said, he was not charged Monday with uh, making threats against the former president or a candidate for president, which itself carries a, a five-year maximum sentence. That could be lengthened, like I said, since he was wielding his uh, AK-47, the preferred rifle of communists. Now, uh, part of uh, Ralph's rap sheet includes an arrest in North Carolina in 2002 for weapons violations and terroristic threats. This is all according to public records. He apparently had a three-hour standoff with law enforcement in North Carolina, and uh, he was uh, convicted of possessing a weapon of mass destruction, a fully automatic weapon. Now, authorities have also raided his North Carolina home, and it's unclear uh, what they were able to find, but apparently he did have a Biden-Harris sticker on the bumper of one of the cars that was recovered at the house. Uh, Routh has also made at least 19 small donations uh, since 2019 to Act Blue a Democrat political action committee uh, campaign finance records uh, indicate. It's not clear if the bulletproof vest officers uh, found anything in the Greensboro, North Carolina home, but we'll have to wait and see. But here's a quick recap, a quick summary. All right, former President Donald Trump survived an assassination attempt at the Trump International Golf Club in West Palm Beach on September 15th of 2024. Uh, former President Trump sent out a statement to supporters as well as to a staff that he was safe and well. He also sent out a tweet that said O-2. Now the suspect identified as Ryan uh, Routh is a currently a resident of Hawaii and he was able to get within 300 to 500 yards of uh, the former president at a chain link fence on the edge of the golf course where like I said, he had an AK-47, preferred rifle of communists, and a GoPro camera set up apparently to record the shooting. Now, 
Ralph has a history of supporting progressive causes online and has, like I said, made at least 19 donations to Democratic candidates since 2019. A Secret Service agent spotted an open fire on Ralph as he put his gun through the fence. The suspect fled and was arrested on I-95 a short time later. According to the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, Trump's security detail was lighter because he isn't a sitting president, despite the previous attempts on his life in July. I don't know. I think this is going to be an interesting one, ladies and gentlemen, because normally everyone winds up dead in these kinds of situations. I'm curious to see what this guy has to say. I'm curious to see if this guy makes it. We'll have to see if he gets suicided like Epstein or something. Oh my gosh, we said it. That guy named Jeff. That's right. We'll have to wait and see. Next, Ashley Benefield is alleging juror misconduct and she wants a new trial after a jury rejected her self-defense claim. That's right. Ashley Benefield, convicted of manslaughter for killing her husband, is asking for a new trial in a motion for a new trial filed by her defense, saying that a juror illegally smuggled a phone into the deliberation room. And um, obviously now she is awaiting sentencing after a jury failed to believe her story that she shot her husband, Douglas Benefield, in self-defense. And now she paces a potential sentence of 30 years behind bars. Her attorneys are trying to get her a new trial and have cited a number of issues that went on in the case. Now, defense attorneys accuse prosecutors of making several improper and inflammatory remarks during their closing argument in the case, including telling the jury that Doug had filed for sole custody before the death. In fact, it was Ashley who had filed for sole custody before the shooting. Now, the defense also took issue with the prosecutors calling Ashley a manipulator at least 14 times and accused the state of ridiculing her emotional testimony. The motion for a new trial includes a motion to interview the juror who was convicted, um, who convicted Ashley Benefield, and her attorneys have said that a juror who has yet to be identified brought a cell phone into the jury room and used it to communicate while the deliberations were ongoing. Now, it is alleged that some guy online um, who goes by that hoodie guy commented on a live stream uh, during the trial that deliberations that Ashley's attorneys say are proof that someone was communicating inside the jury room. In a series of messages that began 10 minutes before parties were told there was a verdict, that hoodie guy said, verdict incoming. And my sister snuck a flip phone in. She texts me 5 to 1 guilty, may compromise on manslaughter. Two minutes after that message, the jury returned the compromise verdict of manslaughter. Now, defense attorneys say they also want to talk to juror 15, accused of lying on a questionnaire during voir dire. The juror failed to disclose her personal history with domestic violence and the fact that she is a party to a custody situation very similar to Ms. Benefield. Gee, where have we heard that before? That's right, Scott Peterson, right? Anyway, prosecutors have opposed the defense motion to interview the jurors, saying nothing indicates that the verdict would have been different, even if there was juror misconduct. Hmm. Anyway, both sides will argue their position in motions, hearing that is scheduled for September 16th. Ashley's sentencing is now scheduled for October 22nd. So let's break this down, ladies and gentlemen. If there was, in fact, a juror, in the jury room communicating with somebody via a cell phone, Ashley Benefield should get a new trial. She should. That is just absolutely wrong. I think all the other stuff, uh, there were contemporaneous objections made during uh, the closing arguments as it relates to the uh, misstatements, the overcharacterizations that the prosecutor made, etc. But it doesn't really matter. That's called closing arguments. You make your objection, you move on. I don't see the district court judge who made those objections. If he thought it was something egregious and outrageous, he would have uh, declared a mistrial at that particular time. But the judge admonished the attorneys and told the jury that they um, need to consider their collective memory as to what they believe. This is argument. So I don't think that's going anywhere. But juror misconduct, going someplace. Uh, as it relates to juror number 15, who didn't disclose that she's in a very similar situation uh, close to the defendant, should have been brought up, but is it going to be enough? I don't know. But I really wish people would just be honest. That's what voir dire, voir dire, however you want to pronounce it, is supposed to be for. It means, it's a French word, to speak the truth, to see if you are a fair and impartial jury. And part of the process is, ladies and gentlemen, is, ladies and gentlemen, potential jurors, if you... We're sitting in my client's seat right here 
as a defendant, would you want somebody like you to be sitting in judgment of that particular case? And the juror should ask themselves, hey, you know what? I've had a very similar situation. I don't think that I would be a good juror for this case. It doesn't mean that it wouldn't be a good juror in the future, but maybe it just means I would not be a good juror on this particular case. Be honest. And unless and until judges start reversing cases, this kind of stuff is going to continue on and on and on. So if they can prove that there was communications from a juror, she, get, she, she should get a new trial. All the other stuff, probably not enough. They'll take it up on appeal. Okay, big secret here, ladies and gentlemen. Shh, don't tell everybody. But apparently, there's corruption in New York City. I know, say it isn't so. I mean, we got the mayor and all of his people being investigated, their homes raided, their electronic devices seized for alleged corruption. Now, we'll give all those people the benefit of the uh, presumption of innocence because they haven't been charged. But guess who has been charged? And we'll still give them the presumption of innocence, but two retired New York City Fire Department fire chiefs were arrested by the feds early Monday morning for allegedly accepting more than $190,000 in bribes to help fast track safety inspections and reviews. So Anthony Sacavino and Brian Cordasco who worked in the Fire Department of New York's Bureau of Fire Prevention, were arrested on bribery, corruption, and false statement offenses as part of a long-running corruption probe, according to a federal indictment unsealed in Manhattan U.S. District Court. Now, the two are accused of soliciting and accepting tens of thousands of dollars in bribe payments in exchange for providing preferential treatment to certain individuals and companies with matters pending before the Fire Department of New York from 2021 through 2023. Now, I'm sure they could probably just do what most politicians say is that I was just helping people out, honest services, just doing what I was supposed to do. I didn't receive any money. If these people wanted to give me a gift or something else, that works for politicians, right? Why not fire department inspectors? Anyway, it's alleged that for nearly two years, Sacavino and Cordasco misused their authority for their own financial gain, according to the indictment. And the arrest comes after two former chiefs had their homes raided by the FBI and the city investigators back in February. Now, the uh, fire department in New York's Brooklyn headquarters was also searched at that same time. At the time of the raid, both Sacavino and Cordasco allegedly lied to federal investigators to conceal their involvement in the bribery scheme. And the nearly two-year scheme involved roughly 30 different projects across the Big Apple, including fire alarm checks at apartment buildings, restaurants, bars, and hotels. Now, they have both been charged with conspiracy to solicit and receive a bribe, solicitation and receipt of a bribe, honest services, wire fraud, conspiracy to commit honest services, wire fraud, and making false statements. That's what happens, ladies and gentlemen, when the bureaucracy gets so big, you got to start getting bribes to get anything done. Just like crime creates poverty, bureaucracy creates corruption. What can you say, ladies and gentlemen? You heard it here first. Next, a murder for hire where, well, the person wasn't actually a cop or didn't run off and tell the police. So a woman by Jalissa Hill appeared in court Friday morning as she faces charges in the killing of, wait for it, her grandparents. Now, she is accused of first-degree murder after police said that she worked in conjunction with her former boyfriend, a guy by the name of Maurice Anthony Newsom, to murder her octogenarian grandparents, Major and Claudette Melvin, at their Fort Lauderdale home. Now, the two were found shot to death and their vehicle was stolen. Police said the deadly shooting happened back on March 22nd of this year. Now, police arrested Newsom in the murder case in late August, and following uh, the Melvin's death, their red Ford Fusion was stolen from their driveway and immediately became the center of the investigation. Newsom somehow was linked to the car. About two weeks after the murders, it was located at a tow yard in Wilton Manors after a man tipped off police after seeing the vehicle on the news. In Newsom's Previous arrest warrants, police said Hill voluntarily submitted to a polygraph test and was untruthful on the question of being involved in the death of the grandparents. I'm not sure why that would be in any affidavit whatsoever, since 
polygraphs are garbage. Anyway, according to court documents, um, Hill had told police after the killing that she was in line to inherit her grandparents' home. She resided with them. And apparently that's um, in a note that uh, Miss Hill wrote. But Jalissa stated that uh, she wrote the note at the beginning of the year to have a goal. The court document stated the note showed a goal to fix up and renovate a home that at the time did not belong to her. Police said in a later interview she would claim she was never in line to receive her grandparents' home. She also filed an insurance claim for her grandmother's stolen car without disclosing that they were in fact dead. Now, according to detectives, Hill also sent Newsom $1,000 on April 27th. And um, one of Melvin's children, a guy by the name of Dennis Parker, predicted Newsom would sing like a mockingbird following his August arrest. That same family member reacted to Hill's arrest by saying, quote, I'm going to stand in the gap for my mom and dad, okay? If you had anything to do with it, I want you to rot in hell. Miss Hill is to rot in hell, according to other family members. Anyway, Hill was being uh, held without bond at the Broward Jail as of Friday afternoon. And finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. A repeat customer, ladies and gentlemen. Do you remember Chelsea Whitened? Well, she and her boyfriend were apparently in the kitchen about to grab a bite to eat when her boyfriend discovered that, uh, well, his glass dildo was inside White's backpack in the uh, couple's residence. Now, this is about 11 p.m., a little tussle starts, and uh, White and the 35-year-old victim exchanged some uh, blows. After the pair briefly separated, the man told cops White began hitting him again and again after he went to grab the backpack. Now, Miss White was standing in the kitchen and threw the glass dildo at her boyfriend. The glass dildo then missed this target, instead hitting a door and waking the couple's child. Now, Miss White subsequently grabbed the bag and walked away from the property. She was located hours later and arrested for domestic charges. Now, Miss White, who is locked up in the jail and has a $1,000 bond, will be arraigned on Wednesday. Her next court appearance will be October 4th. When questioned by deputies about the recent confrontation, though, the victim said that uh, Miss White was arrested in the past for a similar incident where they got into an altercation over a dildo. Now, Miss White was busted back in uh, 2022 when a verbal argument over a handbag and a sex toy turned uh, into a confrontation. Uh, investigators charged Miss White um, because she kicked and bit the victim who had asked White to return the sex toy to him because he owned it. White, however, refused to give the sex toy back to the victim. White was subsequently found guilty of battery and sentenced to 12 months of probation. She was ordered to pay $800 in fines and court costs and was required to complete a batterer's intervention program. Now, it's not exactly clear if it is the same dildo involved in the 2022 incident as the now 2024 incident, but does it really matter? Apparently, Miss White can't keep her hands to herself off of other people's things. Twice now, it's been the boyfriend's toy. You can't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. You can't make this stuff up. Anyway, Miss White, you are in fact our dumb criminal of the day. Congratulations, a double winner. I can only think maybe of one or two other people that have been double winners of our dumb criminal of the day. Congratulations, Miss White. You truly have made it. All right, that's all we have for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk. And remember, yes, that pesky constitution, it matters. Mm -hmm.